Good evening and welcome to the fastest half hour in the cryptid world, This Week in Bigfoot. The news show that scours the internet and the Bigfoot community each and every week so you don't have to. Then we take it and wrap it up in a nice neat 30 minute package. If it has to do with Sasquatch and Bigfoot of the Wild Man, we've got it all covered. Well, summer's here and it looks like Bigfoot news keeps on rolling in. Dogman reports are on the rise, so what exactly does that mean for Bigfoot? Is there room at the top for two cryptids? Bigfoot sightings in forest cover what's the connection, The Professor Mike Lucci's got that story. Snowwalker does his best Attenborough imitation in another bang in two minutes with, and Expedition Bigfoot gets set to head north to the future. These stories and much more, so you better buckle up, because we got a lot to cover this week. Let's get at it. Our lead story tonight, the rise of Dogman. In recent years, the Bigfoot community has hit a roadblock, struggling to find concrete evidence and breakthroughs regarding the elusive creature. As a result, interest and enthusiasm in Dogman has surged. Despite decades of searching and countless reported sightings, the existence of Bigfoot remains unproven. The lack of progress has left some in the Bigfoot community frustrated and disillusioned. The phenomenon of the dogman has witnessed a recent upswing causing a paradigm shift in the world of cryptozoology. As interest in the bipedal canine grows, certain demographics have displayed a decline in enthusiasm for the legendary Bigfoot. One factor contributing to dogman's rise is its popularity among the younger generations. While Bigfoot has long been the most renowned cryptid, its followers tend to be older, with the average age between 40 and 55, primarily consisting of males. Dogman, on the other hand, tends to attract a significantly younger audience, particularly those in their 20s and 30s, with a much more balanced male-to-female ratio, surprisingly enough. And this may be due to its association with horror and the paranormal, appealing to the broader interest of a younger generation. As the age of Bigfoot followers slowly advances, it's likely that their interest in the creature will eventually wane providing an opportunity for other cryptids like the Dogman to take the spotlight. A clear indicator of Dogman's ever-growing popularity is its increased presence in conferences and events. Just a few years ago, you couldn't find a conference or a festival that included Dogman in the program. Now, however, in an attempt to attract the younger audiences and their disposable incomes, more and more event organizers have added Dogman panels and presenters to once-only Bigfoot events. For example, the Michigan Bigfoot Dogman Conference the Penn Ohio Paranormal Conference and Paranormal Roundtable's Dogman Cryptid Conference are just three examples of Dogman sharing the stage with what was once an exclusive Bigfoot lineup. While Bigfoot has been part of the popular culture for decades and stories have been handed down for over a century, the Dogman remains a relatively new mystery. A single newspaper article inadvertently set the stage for the subsequent rise of the Dogman phenomenon. It all began in the early 1990s when a local newspaper, the Walworth County Week, assigned little-known reporter Linda Godfrey to cover the story. Godfrey was initially skeptical, but later became convinced of the sincerity of many of the witnesses published in the article, recounting their eerie encounters of the sightings of Beast of Bray Road. Named for the rural road in which it was first purportedly sighted, the articles later became the book entitled The Beast of Bray Road, Tailing Wisconsin's Werewolf. The article detailed the experiences of witnesses who claimed to have come face to face with a mysterious creature resembling a werewolf or a wolf-like humanoid. The chilling descriptions along with the evocative headlines ignited public interest and curiosity. It was against this backdrop that the Dogman phenomenon began to take shape. Inspired by the accounts of the Beast of Bray Road, individuals from across the country began reporting sightings and encounters of a similar creature which they dubbed Dogman. The descriptions mirrored those of the Beast of Bray Road, bipedal, wolf-like beings with glowing eyes and fearsome appearances. The rise of the Dogman phenomenon can be attributed in part to the power of storytelling and the amplifying effect of the media. As the popularity of Dogman grew, it began to overshadow the once-dominant presence of the Beast of Bray Road. Conferences and events, which were traditionally centered around Bigfoot and other cryptids, began incorporating Dogman into their programs it became clear that the allure of the Dogman was captivating a new generation of fans and researchers. 
And while the decline of the Beast of Bray Road may have inadvertently contributed to this shift, it's clear that the legend and the lore of these mysterious creatures will persist as long as there are those who seek the unknown and embrace the thrill of the unexplained. Despite the lack of progress in the Bigfoot community, most researchers and believers maintain their optimism about the future of the elusive creature. They believe that continued efforts to study and document the creature will eventually yield results, even if the progress is excruciatingly slow. In the meantime, the Dogman phenomenon shows no signs of fading away, as each year more and more people are captivated by this creature, potential for new discoveries and groundbreaking revelations. As we hear the show continue to report on the shifting landscape of cryptozoology, it's becoming more and more evident that the decline of Bigfoot is paving the way for Dogman to one day take center stage. And while we here at This Week in Bigfoot remain committed to covering the latest developments in the world of Bigfoot, we can confidently say that a This Week in Dogman show is not on the horizon anytime soon. Up next, Mike Lucci takes a look at forest cover and its relationship to Bigfoot sightings. Mike? So what's more important for a potential Bigfoot encounter? Do we need lots of forests or lots of forest cover? With more alleged reports happening closer to or even within busier suburban areas, some think it's evidence that swatches are more abundant than we originally thought, and they might be living right under our noses. They're arguing that swatches don't necessarily need miles of remote wilderness to be found, just enough cover to stay hidden. I examine this narrative by looking for any patterns that might arise in reports between states with high forest coverage and acreage. I compared five data sets for each state. Total Bigfoot reports, reports per 100,000 people, total forest of acreage, forest cover percentage, and sightings per 10,000 acres. A look at states with high forest cover percentages barely showed any noteworthy overlap. In fact, among states with the most sightings per 100,000 people, 11 of the top 15 states have less than 50% forest coverage, and of those 11, 8 are only covered by less than 35%. So just keep that in mind. When looking at states with the most forested acres, however, things change. Seven of them are also among the most reports per 100,000 people, and a whopping nine have some of the highest total Bigfoot reports. Furthermore, over half of the country's 15 states with the most forested acres have less than 50% forest coverage, and seven of those eight are covered by less than 41%. In terms of total forested acres, the magic number here seems to be 20 million. Of the 12 states above that threshold, seven have some of the highest total Bigfoot reports while well, six have some of the highest reports per 100,000 people. Even among states with the most sightings per 10,000 acres, out of the 16 instances you see any overlap with the other four data sets, nine are states with over 20 million forested acres. Now, there's obviously a lot of variables to consider that we could probably spend a whole episode examining, but if these surface findings are any indication it seems to show that when it comes to having a potential Bigfoot encounter, having more forested area and a certain number at that is more important than forest coverage. Today's episode of This Week in Bigfoot is sponsored by Got Knockers Apparel and Clothing. From hoodies and caps to soaps, keychains, and bats. Got Knockers has everything you need to show your love of Bigfoot. For more information and to shop their items, be sure to visit the Got Knockers page on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Got Knockers. Hey, Got Knockers? Now, over the past three years, Curse of Oak Island's executive producer Matthew Ginsburg's action series, Expedition Bigfoot, has taken viewers on a thrilling journey. The hunt for evidence to unravel the mystery surrounding the elusive creature we've all come to know and love, Bigfoot. The series kicked off December 8th, 2019, supposedly in the dense forests and misty mountains of the Pacific Northwest, ground zero for Bigfoot sightings. 
Build as an elite team of specialists using an advanced data algorithm to pinpoint when and where they're most likely to encounter Bigfoot, then supervised by Bryce Johnson, the B-movie actor you may recognize from such roles like Rick in the 2008 indie film, Trucker. Hey there. Hey there. Do you, do you know me? No, I don't know you. Maybe I could, though, if I tried real hard. Yeah. Um, well, I'm Rick. I'm Runner's brother-in-law. Oh, Rick. In addition to Johnson, Russell Accord, Myra Mayer, and Ronnie LeBlanc set out armed with cutting-edge technology and camera crews to hunt down and hopefully capture indisputable evidence of the elusive creature Bigfoot. What was originally marketed as a harrowing experience and pioneering endeavor in an undisclosed remote location in a 90,000-acre swath in Central Oregon was later revealed by the online community to actually be the luxurious five-star dude ranch, Anton Ranch which features jet skiing, luxury cabins, haunted hayrides, and a landing strip for private jets. As a matter of fact, the entire season one was filmed in and around the resort, instead of the wilds of Oregon, as originally stated, showcasing the magic of TV production and the careful planning involved, as each episode was skillfully outlined and produced to deliver an engaging television-friendly narrative. In other words, entertainment, not research. Quickly wanting to put the debacle of season one's location outing in the rearview mirror, season two, Chasing Shadows, aired January 3rd, 2021. And after coming closer than ever to proving the existence of Bigfoot in Oregon in season one, the production suddenly decided to relocate their search to the mountains of Kentucky, where the team wandered for 21 days throughout the Appalachians, call blasting, investigating caves, and repelling long abandoned train trestles for no apparent reason before returning once again to the Pacific Northwest, this time Washington State, where they enlist a hypnotist, record a disappearing Bigfoot crossing a river, create a conspiracy around unmarked helicopters, and are forced to evacuate due to wildfires, right when they were once again on the verge of discovering evidence that would prove the creature's existence. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Ironically entitled The Pursuit of Truth, Season 3 kicked off March 20th of last year. The 14-episode season found the team once again returning to the Olympic Peninsula to continue their pursuit of Bigfoot. At the top of an isolated ridge, and most likely led there by members of the Olympic Project, Bryce steps into a tangle of interwoven leaves that Myra immediately recognizes as a nest. Much like the one seen in the Small Town Monsters Beyond the Trail Bigfoot episode, filmed in the same location the year prior. But a lot of the original ones were found right here kind of around trees and uh, I'm going to demonstrate this. If I was laying here, I could see, you know, your, I don't know how you'd, <laughs> how Sasquatch would lay, but I mean, this is kind of the rough idea and there's like a little crawl path almost right here. And I mean, subsequently this could have been used by other wildlife, but um, I don't know. It's not a stretch to say this is probably one of the most interesting Sasquatch related pieces of evidence, I think, of the 21st century. While Bryce and Meyer take eDNA samples and look for hairs in the first nest, Russell and Ronnie search the area nearby and, to everyone's surprise, discover a second nest. Apparently stunned by these findings, the team decides to observe from afar, hoping that whatever built the nests will return. Unfortunately, after several days of staking out the area, the team finds no evidence of the creatures emerge from the safety of the inaccessible federal land. Now, if that's not a carefully organized, outlined, and filmed conclusion to a television season, don't know what is. That being said, Expedition Bigfoot fans are still eagerly awaiting the highly anticipated Season 4, which, if scheduling holds true, is set to air later this year or early 2024. So without further ado, the teaser for Season 4, Expedition Bigfoot. Next season on Expedition Bigfoot. Alaska is unforgiving. Doesn't care how tall you are, how short you are, or who you know or who you don't know. If you're not careful in this country, it'll take you out quick. And there's a vastness in Alaska that makes you feel small. The trees are towering, the ground consumes you. 
feels more wild, more raw than anywhere else we've been before. If there's anywhere that a creature could be hiding and thriving, it's going to be on an island like this. Now, it's important to remember that Expedition Bigfoot, like other shows in its genre, is ultimately a meticulously planned television production. The shows and its episodes are designed to showcase specific technologies, deliver an immersive storyline. And while the excitement and intrigue are genuine, it's important to distinguish between the show's entertainment value and the reality behind the scenes. To keep things in perspective, here's a list of all the personnel that are working on the series to date. What's weird is I can see where the other nest is from here. You're gonna lie of sight. Holy shit, dude. One thing that we noticed right away was this direct line of sight from this smaller nest to the larger one. Maybe we're looking at a juvenile's nest and mama's nest is within close sight so she can keep an eye on her young. We're standing over a nest right now, and what's even weirder is... You guys are in our line of sight. Are you serious? Oh my gosh. Right there? When we're out in the field, we want to find tangible evidence or any sign of this creature's alleged existence. Maybe that's why Bigfooters are so infatuated with stick structures and those weird bends or breaks in trees. Researchers believe swatches might use them as hunting blinds, markers, travel routes, even portals or whatever, not to, not to discount the woo crowd. I mean, it's all fascinating, but uh, you even got to admit some of the explanations for why they use these things or make them are highly speculative and at times almost inventive. Remember, we want to come away with something when out in the field. So we'll find reasons to amount something out of nothing. And it's likely a possibility that's what's happening with these so-called tree manipulations. The three most common arguments I hear are what could be strong or tall enough to do X, Y, Z, to move those giant logs or break that thick branch or bend that branch high, that high above the ground? Um, we're off trail. Why would somebody else be in this part of the woods? Or why does it look like a perfect X or some other geometric shape? I mean, at face value, it doesn't matter where, on or off the trail, you find one of these things. There's a whole laundry list of natural, tangible, even other unconventional explanations that are far more likely to have bent or broken that tree than a squatch. Snow, wind, ice, uh, rain, animals, flood debris, other trees, other people. I mean, if something like this could happen in a hurricane, why can't a branch have nearly broken off in more of a twisting manner instead of a regular snap off or why can't a few tree limbs happen to fall around each other at a conveniently peculiar angle instead of something like a squash setting them up like that patterns exist everywhere in nature things are breaking and falling in the woods all the damn time we sometimes forget that people in nature do really weird shit and frankly if you consider yourself a dedicated researcher you should probably know better Natural occurrences aside, you can't just rule out other people with the stuff. And frankly, humans probably have just as, if not more, reasons to build these random stick structures or tree structures. Uh, hunting blinds, camping or survival skills, some weird game a bunch of kids made up, trail markers, rituals, even artistic expression. If you're wondering why anyone else would be out in the middle of the woods? Uh, those are some pretty good damn answers right there. Look, this wasn't meant to be upsetting or belittling, but the whole stick structures thing, this part of the Bigfoot phenomena, it has a dissenting viewpoint that people aren't being nearly as realistic about. 
because of the very hard truths it potentially contains. And while acknowledging those hard truths won't take away from the possibility of Bigfoot's existence, they also shouldn't let our standards for pushing the ball forward towards getting the truth in this field be dictated by what we want to be the case. Well, 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 it's that time again, folks. Part of the show where we give content creator Michael Merchant, a.k.a. Snowwalker Prime, screen time to speak his mind and get what's ever bothering him off his chest. We call it Two Minutes With. Remember, remember the 5th of November. The gunpowder, treason, and plot. I can think of no reason why the gunpowder and treason should ever be forgot. I can't believe people are giving her money. After 10 years, people must have forgot. That's it. They don't remember. The pain and the suffering. Five long years of waiting. Delays. It was the lab coat for me. Couldn't write that check fast enough. I mean, those lab coats are hard to come by. She's wearing a lab coat. She's got to be legit. You know who I want sequencing my Bigfoot DNA? Somebody in a lab coat. COVID mask and surgical gloves. One of the samples came from Matilda, the sleeping Sasquatch. So calm and habituated that researchers could just camp out by it and count its sleeping breaths. We were promised a documentary, HD crystal clear footage, with the DNA confirmed as being part angel, part human. Originally, we were collecting leprechaun DNA, but we found that there was a market for Sasquatch DNA. No one wanted to touch the leprechaun DNA. We were trying to get unicorn DNA, but it was impossible to find a virgin. Woolly mammoth DNA, everybody's got that. And we're bringing back the dodo bird as an alternative to chicken. Everybody has a robot, that's old hat. Get your child a pet Sasquatch. Just need a few hundred square miles of tundra and David Atterborough to narrate the documentary. Flying drone shot of vast herds of foraging Sasquatch, riding their mammoths, holding dodo birds in their hands. Grasslands, one of our planet's most productive landscapes. The Serengeti sustains herds of over a million wildebeest. You see, to the Sasquatch, the dodo bird is just like a chicken. All we had to do was wait 10 years for people to forget. You know, it would be great if we had a scientist and if we had some Sasquatch DNA, we could have the scientists sequence it. Yeah, 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 oh, that's great. You know what would be even better? Instead of a scientist, let's get a cat veterinarian. How is it we can get Sasquatch DNA, but we can't get a clear photo? Be better than a pet rock. Your own cloned Sasquatch. Is little Billy being picked on by bullies at school? Get him his own Sasquatch. Does Billy need somebody to push him on the swing? Get him his own Sasquatch. Why stop there? Let's clone the mermaid. I have a mermaid in my pool. I have one in my hot tub. Make it a little ticklish bringing home sushi though. My mom's a mermaid. So easy there, just hybrids. You just put the two of them together. You sound kind of cynical. Jealous and a bully picking on a woman. What does her gender have to do with it? What does her gender have to, in this day and age, what does her gender have to do with it? I'm just saying. You're a guy, she's a girl. I don't want to see just saliva on a slide. I want to see the Sasquatch, the 800 pound Sasquatch that you got the sample from. No more blurry video, sleeping Matilda. What body in a box or a cloning chamber in the cloning chamber. 10 years, must've been just enough time. I'm sorry, what were you saying? I got a text I was looking at. These footprint photos were posted on the Coalition for Critical Thinking's Facebook page last Sunday morning by member Michelle Blount. They were apparently taken by a gentleman named Joseph Wheeler in Fairbanks, Alaska at a local lake. And while there's nothing in the photo to give a scale, Wheeler claims that the prints were approximately three inches larger than his size 14 and led straight into the woods. So what do you think? Let us know in the comment section. Hey, this is Chuck Larson. You're watching the CARC channel on YouTube. 
It's time to catch you up to speed in a couple of recent Bigfoot podcasts and live streams. First up, the Squatching Cowboy. In his latest upload, the good old boy is fed up with all the BS currently going on within the Bigfoot community. That makes two of us. Let's check it out. Don't just sit there and take a picture of a dark spot in the bush and expect me to think it's a Bigfoot and then circle it with a red pen and say, here's a Bigfoot and here's a Bigfoot and here's a Bigfoot. I seen something on Facebook the other day that had a picture a row of trees and it had like 13, 14, 15 little circles on there so there was that many Bigfoot in that, vi- in that picture. I don't believe it, people. If you want me to believe it, you better go back and do some research on it. See if you can find some tracks. Get a little closer, maybe. Zoom in a little better. Next, it's everyone's favorite blob squatch researcher, Crypto Reality, showcasing a 25-foot Sasquatch he discovered in the Sunshine State. Let's take a look. I think it's only natural to flinch at this. Um, I know it took me five years to um, to get it to where I would even put it out. So we finally did it. There are creatures in existence right now that are over 20 feet right here in the state of Florida. And that's one of them. What does this mean? Okay, back to reality. In the third spot, Squatch Talk with Pat Turner. In this show, Pat drinks too much and talks to these two jokers about apers versus the Woo Clan. Let's take a listen. There could be stuff going on in nature that, that, that we don't know about, right? So... Bigfoot could be part of that. Bigfoot could not be part of that. Well, they could that's be. That's what a, I was getting around about with long-winded way. It's a really physical thing. I'm not lying a lot, though. It's a huh? huge impl- implication. What's that now? It, it, that's a huge implication. If you're going to use that analogy, dude, you're saying we're the primitives. Yes, you know, we could be. We could we're very the primitives well be. that are dealing with the whatever a thousand years ahead of us, and we just can't comprehend it. How much of our brain do we use, right? What is it like? They, they don't 5%? fucking wear clothes, man. They look like monkey people. Like <laughs> they don't look like advanced. Like, this is the foot, UFO thing. Bigfoot, you know? like an old Spring Break '89 fucking tank top. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, what they bang on trees, they do wood knocks. I mean. Batting cleanup this week, Russ Jones and Brad Kenneman talk with the OBC's Mark DeWorth about the success of this year's conference and what's in store for next year. It's wide open on Untold Radio. Let's check it out. Hey, Mark, how many people did you have at the Ohio conference this year? Well, I mean, you know, the the, the lodge told me that they estimated there was over, over 5,000 that came through on Saturday and you know, they, they just kept coming. I mean, it was nonstop people coming and going, coming and going, com- coming and going. Saw so many people that showed up at five o'clock saying, wow, we didn't, we just found out about this. So we drove all the way down, you know, thank God it, the vendors were open to about seven. And uh, so it was uh, just a ton of people. And, you know, that's part of the fun is just having people come down with families and, and just, you know, they just have a general interest in the subject and, uh, you know, it just plants a seed for next year and it, and it makes everyone happy and you meet new people. And I mean, my, my inbox has been just absolutely blown up s- since that event and it still is getting blown up and people yeah, we- just want to know more. People want to know how to prepare to get tickets for next year. And, it, you know, like I say, I wish I had an event that could hold a thousand people in seating. And because if I had it, I could fill it. It wouldn't be a problem at all. Summer's here and Bigfoot conferences are still rolling on. That being said, there's only one guy we can all turn to to keep us up to speed on the who's, the what's, and the where's, and that's Chuck Larson with another great show in this week's Spotlight. The third annual West Virginia Bigfoot Festival is a yearly event located in downtown Sutton, West Virginia. This year's event kicks off Friday, June 24th, with a VIP dinner featuring the Adventure Hat duo of Ken Gerhardt and Lyle Blackburn. The festival day starts at noon, Saturday, June 25th, as Main Street Sutton comes alive, with arts and crafts vendors, food trucks, 
Bigfoot contests, live music, and research workshops by Daniel Benoit, Mike Famala, Andrea Billup, and Michael C. Cook. The event is family friendly, complete and free, and easily one of the best Bigfoot festivals south of Mason Dixon Line. For more information on the VIP event and festival schedule, be sure to visit the event's Facebook page. And that's this week's Conference Spotlight. Brendan, take us out. All right, folks, looks like that's it. Once again, we're out of time for this week. I'd like to thank you for watching and remind you to like and share everything we do here at the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective. Tell your friends. And if you have any questions or comments or maybe a story for the show, you can always drop us a line at This Week in Bigfoot Newscast at gmail.com. So until next week, for Mike Lucci and Chuck Larson, I'm Brendan Brown reminding you that when it comes to getting your Bigfoot news, be informed, not biased. Bye-bye.